this hench bad lad. The BBC Micro was a staple in UK schools in the 80s and 90s. Created by Acorn and originally named The Proton, the UK's primary TV and radio broadcasters British Broadcasting Corporation chose it to be their official computer in 1982. This led to it gracing many a classroom as part of the broadcasting company's computer literacy project. I remember at one time thinking they looked so heavy and I was scared of them breaking the desks. But because it was a school, the only software that we had was educational stuff, obviously, which, I'll be honest, I don't have especially fond memories of. There was a maths one that I vaguely remember which bored the arse off me. The one BBC micro game that many, many 80s and 90s kids will remember from school is Granny's Garden. I did cover it briefly in my edutainment video, where I erroneously said it was made by a subsidiary of Channel 4. I have no idea why I thought that, I'm sorry, I've whipped myself a hundred times and prayed for forgiveness from our Lord and Saviour. He didn't respond. In fact, he's probably blocked me. I'll just add him to the list of people I can expect a restraining order from. One of the key developers and publishers of educational computer games in the 80s and 90s were Formation. The company is still alive, mainly selling its old games in updated formats rather than making new ones. Granny's Garden is in fact still available to buy, and that includes the retro version too, actually. Digital download only. If you want the discs, you're gonna need to go to eBay. But I'm a skin flint, and I'm using the original BBC Micro version. Now, this initial version of Granny's Garden came out in 1983. Since the BBC Micro was pretty standard issue in schools in Great Britain, this is probably the one you played if you did play it at school in the 80s. However, it was also released on the ZX Spectrum, Amstrad CPC in the same year, then Commodore 64 in 1987, and the Amiga in 1989. The original developer appears to have only been involved in the initial BBC Micro version though, with other developers converting it to other formats, but still published by Formation. By the way, these BBC Micro discs have different labels because one was sent to schools and one was the version distributed for home use. I am told that this verbatim disc label was honestly how they were sent out for schools. Snazzy. That's some pretty epic laziness there. I'm kind of impressed actually. Now the person behind Granny's Garden and the company behind it was one Mike Matson, a deputy head teacher who was inspired by playing a friend's copy of the 1977 text-only game Adventure. He decided to teach himself how to make a game that he felt his students would enjoy and still learn from. The puzzle and story format of Granny's Garden was birthed from the fact that most schools at the time would only have maybe one or two computers, so Matson would write the game to be well played in groups. Rather than going to a publisher with the game when it was finished, Matson set up formation with his friend Neil Souch. As the flagship game, Granny's Garden would end up being the most popular and now it's the most fondly remembered, likely because at the time, there was nothing out there really for the BBC's education first computer that was quite like it. It really is weird to be playing a game from when I was a very small child 20 years later. I don't remember the exact gameplay of the game, but I do remember really key things like there was a blue raven and there was four dragons, and of course, who could forget that terrifying witch's face? <laughs> I'm so sorry, Horace, I just panicked. What are you doing here anyway? Nobody apart from my subscribers would even know who you are. Look, nobody cares, Horace, they just want me to play this game. <sighs> right. Oh, you're staying then. 
Now, if you grew up in the UK or you were knocking about here until the late 90s or early 2000s, you might recognise this style of illustration. The coding language for the BBC Micro was BBC Basic, written predominantly by computer scientist Sophie Wilson and her team, and created as a version of Basic, intended for the BBC's aforementioned UK Computer Literacy Project. Basic uses display modes, a statement which sets the video display. Mode 1, for example, is of the ASCII type, has graphics resolution of 320 by 256 and 2 bits per pixel, with possibilities of 4 colours in total. Each numbered mode has a different display output, and the one used by default in BBC Basic was Mode 7. This is the mode also used by Teletext. When Acon's Proton would become the BBC Micro, BBC wanted its default mode to be set to Mode 7 so that it could also be used for CFAX, which was BBC's Teletext service. So the main similarities you may see with BBC Basic games are the resolution, pixel aspect and the colours. Isn't it weird how small things like that can be entirely highly recognisable across formats. That being said, even though you may associate the graphics with the machine, Mode 7 wasn't used for every game on the BBC Micro. Far from it, in fact. Although a fair few BBC Micro games did use Mode 7 for the title screens only for space reasons, other modes were used. Frack has Mode 7 title cards, but the main game uses Mode 1. People who were kids at the time might recognise this other fondly remembered BBC Micro game, which again, isn't presented in Mode 7. Don't touch my BBC Micro. Or my ass. The BBC Micro did actually have an add-on which allowed you to view teletext on it without a TV. But that's probably for another video. Oh, before we start, you should know that the game is entirely silent except for some small snippets of music, which we will get to. I'm using music from other BBC Micro games for background music. All right, Horace, since you're apparently in this video now, let's go. Why does this kind of crap keep happening to me? Here we have the fabled first screen. There is a magic tree here. Which one do you think it is? I would love some context right now. This is one of those puzzles where the answer is on a randomizer, although thankfully picking the wrong tree doesn't kill you. There is not enough magic in this tree. There is not enough magic in this tree? Still waiting on the old context there. Well, to be fair, this game is purposely low on the context side. The whole point is to capture children's imagination, so there's no need to spoon feed the plot to the kids. Ah yes! We found the magic tree! But Where are we? Oh. Ah, the good old BBC Micro sound chip that you can't turn down. Jesus. The volume of the music in a BBC Micro program is set in the code, so you can't change it without changing the code. Unless there's some kind of volume changer included in the code of the game. Now the game will encourage you to have some small level of interaction with the computer by asking you questions, like... Do you want to go in the cave? No, Horace! Yes you do. Oh, we don't have a choice anyway. Still, when you're about seven years old and you've had minimal contact with computers, this was pretty cool. And there's a number of times in the game where you have the option to be a bit of a snarky kid. All right, so the king and queen of the mountains have been locked away in here by a wicked witch. And their six kids have been taken away also. How do you have six kids? That must be a madhouse. Imagine the school run. I can barely cope with just the one kid. Oh crap, I didn't get a babysitter. Uh, he'll be fine, right? No. No! It's a magic talking raven. I am the king and queen's blue raven. I have magic powers. Oh, okay. The raven will serve as your guide throughout the game. It doesn't drop any hints or anything, but it's the narrator of sorts, I guess. Would you like me to help you? Seriously, as a seven-year-old school kid, responding to the raven here with no was the absolute height of sophisticated comedy. Up there with the word bullock and telling your teacher that your favourite bird was a blue tit. I am very sorry, but the king and queen say I must help you. First off, the raven tells you you need to go to the woodcutter's house. 
Uh, no mention of how we're gonna get there or how we're gonna get off this mountain. Okay. Now, some of the puzzles in this game are just glaringly obvious, even when you're a small child. Here's the woodcutter's house. You've got to find the hidden word. As a kid, I remember being pretty smug at how quick I got it, but looking at it now, I can see that I had no cause to be. Would you like to take an apple from the tree? Keep the apple safe. I will let us in now. All right, inside the house. Now it goes into a proper text adventure style. We're in the hallway. It is very dark, but you can see a door leading to the kitchen, a door leading to the back room, a cupboard and some stairs. Why is going through the cupboard an option? Isn't it a bit rude to walk into someone's house and just start rifling through the cupboards? What is that? Put, put it away. Where do you wish to go? You're supposed to find Esther here, the first kid. Make sure you pick up an apple on your way into the cottage because you'll need it when you walk to the stairs and there's a snake that's getting ready to just nom you. Uh, uh, throw the apple at it. What a good shot you are. You have killed the snake. Oh, that worked. Wow, what a rubbish snake. There is a huge cooking pot hanging over a very hot fire. I wonder what is in there. Now, Horace, Horace, come on. Horace. Are you going to look in the pot? Uh, no! Horace! Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Ah! Horace, quick! This was a terrifying screen to see. I can't express the sheer terror. It's a mixture of that horrifying face and ethereal, disturbing music that makes this a scary screen. When you were playing this game as a seven-year-old, this was scary! If the witch catches you, she'll send you right back to the start. There's many points in the game where the witch might show up after a bad decision on your part, so you do have to keep on your toes. Look at that chin. What is going on there, love? I have to say I'm very glad that as a kid I never saw the version of her that's on the game cover. Look at those dead, evil eyes. Now that is nightmarish. Plus she's got like eight coke nails, what's that about? <sighs> Uh, okay, quick, get in the cupboard, come on! Before, there was a red broomstick only, but since we killed the snake and got the clue, now there's a green one too. If you touch the red broomstick, the witch will find you, so pick up the green one. Well done. You have found Esther. What the heck are you doing hiding behind a broomstick, Esther? How thin are you? Or were you the broomstick itself? It's unclear. Okay, she's freaking me out. Let's just take her back to the raven. When you find a kid, you'll get a password and your only option is to go back to the start of whichever part you're on. Here we are in part one, so we have to go back to the sodding forest and muck about trying to find a magic tree again. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa! But this time when you get to the mountains, it will ask you if you have a password. When you say it, you'll go to the next area. Got to admit, having to go through the tree bit again is really annoying because it is random. But it is good to have that password feature, just in case you get caught after you've got the first kid. Don't be so rude, Horace! And also, you can talk. Ow! I will help you to find Tom. He has been hidden in the giant's garden. Well, we are supposedly in a giant's garden, which apparently has its own biosphere, because everything in it is huge. Like this chatty mushroom. Hello, I am the talking toadstool. And the insects that he lines up just to help you out. You will need help to cross the pond. These creatures can help you. Oh god, this is like a fever dream. I haven't been this confused since I tried to understand the Legend of Zelda timeline. Uh, well, the butterfly can fly, so maybe it can carry us across? Uh, butterfly. I will try to carry you over the pond. You have to go through a small wood. A shower of nuts is falling on you. Pfft, nuts. Ow! The nuts hurt your head. To get past the falling nuts, you need to crawl into the shell of a snail. Yeah, some of the answers really do push your imagination. A huge black dog is coming. The dog has big yellow teeth. Uh, send the bee at it? I'm going to buzz off after that dog. Now you are safe. I stung the dog's bottom. 
When I was little, I distinctly remember getting to this bit, getting the bee to sting the dog, and then one of the other kids in my class told me that that meant the bee would die. In fact, that's how I learned that when a honeybee stings a human, it will pull out part of its abdomen and intestines by trying to get away. And I'm still having trouble dealing with that fact. Get the spider to help you climb a tree, and here he is, the second kid, Tom. Well done, you have found Tom. These kids are bloody creepy. Mind the dead bee. Oh. Now it's time for part two of the game, which means when you're a kid in the 80s, you need to go find a teacher who probably has no clue how to use a computer to rerun the program for you so you can select part two. Enter the password you got when you found Tom, and we are off to the City of Dragons. I'm seeing a theme with horrifying apparitions in this game. My name is Achu. I am the Keeper of the Gate. Achu? Your name is Achu? This guy asks you what your favourite food is, and you can say anything. But it is cute, isn't it? When I was little, I felt like this game was talking to me. Whenever I have white wine, I start to sneeze. Well, well, hang on a minute, mate. Your parents actually named you after one of your health issues? That's a bit like calling your baby with a chest infection cough cough. Your parents were dicks. Whoa, look at those fantastic graphics. We won't be messing with those dragons. These four baby dragons have been left behind to guard Claire. Oh, but we will be harassing their babies, apparently. You don't say. Ah! You never picked up any of the four items of food you'll need to tame the dragons, but you just have them without explanation. Bit of a bizarre mix though, chips, oranges, lollies and buns. Each item is one of the dragon's favourite food. I wasn't expecting them to be vegetarian, but alright. Here, hold these. There are multiple ways to beat this bit and multiple orders to do so, but you need to be taming one dragon at a time by giving them the food that they like. Alright Horace, now give the yellow dragon the chips. Bribe. So, you need to feed the dragons lollies, which the green one loves, and can then be collared. And then oranges, which the blue one loves, but the green one hates, but since the green one's already tamed, it doesn't matter. La la la, logic puzzle. Well done. You have found Claire and Anna. Alright, we are bossing this, Horace. Come with me to the land of mystery. Okay. What's cool about this is now you've got an entirely different concept in this game. A map. There are five locations in the land of mystery. You have to go between adjacent places to get around, like you can't go from the castle straight to the cottage, for example. This is where you start off, so let's go to the forest. Welcome to the creepy forest. Oh, that name does not fill me with confidence. These trees are pom-pom trees. Horace, come on, it's a kid's game. There is a fire near here. Oh my god, there's a fire! All right, we're in the forest, so let's uh, go to the castle now. That was not a good idea. So this is very unfair. Although there's no movement limit before the witch appears, if you want to get from the forest to the castle, you have to go via the lake or the witch will crop up. There is no explanation for this. I guess she was just snacking around on this particular path, and that's not the only path she can catch you out on either, so to be honest, in the first playthrough of this, I was really on edge knowing that she might crop up at any time. Oh, we made it to the cottage. Did we lose her? What are you doing? Get off! We can either go into the cottage or take the key and leave, so let's take the key. Hope it doesn't belong to the owner of the cottage because we're totally nicking it. Right, the hill. This entire section is meant to get kids reading and thinking, so when you go on the hill you can see a fire burning near the forest. What's that? A giant voice says, I am a hungry giant. Shall I eat you? No. You had better run away quickly then. <laughs> This is my lake. Have you come for water? Uh, no. Do you want to know my name? Sure. My name is Redhorn. Oh. Okay, well we'll just be going then. No, Horace, come on. 
This game is trying to make you think here. You know this Redhorn dude has water, and you know there's a fire near the forest, so at some point we're gonna have to come back here. Obviously that's simple gameplay for an adult, but for a seven year old, you feel like a detective. But for now, let's just go back to the cottage. Okay, let's go into the cottage this time. The witch is inside the cottage. Oh shit! She has a cake in her hand. Uh... Do you want to take the cake? Horace! You have the witch's cake. What just happened? I'm sorry, this woman is on our arse for opening a pot, but we can take a cake from her hand without her noticing? W was she asleep? Why is she holding a cake in her sleep? Why are we watching her sleep? Just, just what is going on here? But, I, I don't, I don't get it. You need to get to the hill, and oddly enough, when the giant asks you if he will eat you, you're supposed to say yes. Don't be silly. I don't really eat people. Oh cool, you're not a cannibal. <laughs> For a minute there, we thought that, um... Well, not many. Oh. The giant doesn't seem too fussed, so we can take a white stone from the hill now, and possibly get away from the giant before we stumble upon his pile of half-eaten bodies. It does seem awfully odd to my adult mind to be telling a giant that I want him to consume me when I'm not feeling especially suicidal today. But of course, a kid's mind has no boundaries and doesn't need an explanation. The fifth kid is going to be in that castle, so let's go there now while we have a few things in our inventory. You cannot pass this way unless you answer my question. What is that? Okay, now we are really seeing the creator scraping the outskirts of his imagination making these creatures. What is that? Uh, does this thing have a ski for a foot? Is that a nose or a trumpet? Well, just look at it though! Well, this thing wants you to tell him the name of his brother, which we now know is Redhorn, because it's that dude from the lake. How are these two related? I'm guessing we're looking at adoption here. I am watching you. I am watching you. I am watching you. I am I am the keeper of the castle of dreams. I am hungry. To enter the castle, you must give me your cake. Just give him the damn cake, Horace. Now we can use the key that we picked up at the cottage to get into the castle of dreams. Yee, it's kind of creepy in here. Oh hey, it's that guy named after his health problems. is happening. This isn't my TV or computer freaking out. This is actually what happens in the game. This is a full 30 seconds or so of complete and utter druggy madness. And I'll be honest, as an adult, I'm kind of scared. Ah, make it stop, make it stop! You have found Daniel. Horace, take the child. We must leave this place. Now we are finally on the last kid. We should probably go and talk to that lad at the lake again and sort out that fire in the forest. Have you come for water? Yes. I want to eat a key first. Can I have your key, please? You know, Horace, I don't think we should be encouraging this guy's piker disorder. All right, let's just get to the forest now. Get treatment. You throw your water onto the fire. The fire is now out. Awesome. Now you can see a tall tower. How did we not see that before? Finally, inside the tower we find Jessica, the final kid. You find Jessica. Oh, the most uh, developed one too, apparently. Is that jug too far? I should probably take that out. That's the end of the adventure. I hope you enjoyed it. We did it! We beat the game! Oh, we got all of the kids. Are we gonna go rescue their mum and dad now? No? All right then, let's just leave the kids here. I suppose social services will pick them up at some point anyway. Ah! Ah! Oh my ears!
The bursts of music like that really do scare the heck out of me. If you do want to play this without the music though, you can just type F anytime you're supposed to press the spacebar. Even creator Mike Matson says in the 1987 Archimedes version instruction book, although the music has been revised, it is still just as aggravating as the original version. And Granny says it's time for tea. Huh? Although Granny's Garden never got an official sequel, Formation did make a very similar in style game the following year in 1984 called Flowers of Crystal. <coughs> oh boy, I should have put a trigger warning on this video. I bet that stirred up some PTSD for those of you who played this as children. I mean, to be honest, I never played this one when I was little because we always wanted to play Granny's Garden instead. It's considerably more difficult because instead of relying on solely the gameplay method of just wandering back and forth with items, it gives you options of what to do next, and the outcome of these choices seems to be down to luck rather than skill. I rage quit on my first go after this utterly terrifying lad killed me. So, what can I say about Granny's Garden after playing it as an adult? Well, granted, some of the things that happen don't really make much sense, but that's what makes it a perfect game for children. Stuff like using the bee to sting the dog, finding one of the royal children behind a broom. How many times as a kid were you playing with friends or siblings and something happened in your make-believe world that didn't make any sense and it didn't need to? We are too restricted by logic and the restrained nature of our adult minds. When we allow ourselves to be too grown up, we lose our imagination. One thing I wondered as a kid though was why is this game called Granny's Garden? Well, I'm guessing from the final line, the magic tree at the start was at the bottom of Granny's Garden, and touching the tree transported us into a wonderful world of make-believe. We were taming dragons and running away from a witch, but the whole time we were really just playing at the bottom of our grand's garden. That is actually really sweet. When I was growing up, my dad would take me and my brother to his mum's place, and my brother and I would tear up and down the garden for ages. That garden would become a number of fantastical places. I think mostly to fix my obsession with becoming a police officer when I grew up, it was some kind of booking station. But dragons and monsters cropped up in there too. Isn't it sad that when you become an adult you have to leave that make-believe world behind? You know what, being an adult sucks. Screw that. We should all act like kids sometimes, because we were all one once and life is very short. I just had a lot of fun playing a game for children, and I had a lot of fun writing the script, and I had a lot of fun larking around like a fool in front of a green screen, pretending to be in this magical game world. If anyone tells you you're immature for playing video games at your age, well, stuff it. Just don't invite them into the garden. Right, after all that, I need to do my boring stupid taxes. That's actually quite a good idea. Actually, no, I'm just going to get drunk while I do them. There is not enough magic in that wine glass. What? Would you like to look under the bottle? <laughs> 